Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society, interviews with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period. My name is Randy Flood, and joining me today is my colleague, Christian Despigna, author of Founding Modern: The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, The American Revolution's Lost Hero. Now, this segment is brought to you by the Real American Revolution public television series and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. So, Christian, why don't you introduce our guest today? Thanks, Randy. Paul Lockhart is professor of history at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, where he teaches European, Scandinavian, and military history. Among his seven, seven single author books are The Drill Master of Valley Forge, The Baron de Steuben and the Making of the American Army, and also The Whites of Their Eyes, Bunker Hill, The First American Army, and The Emergence of George Washington. He was formerly Brage Golding Distinguished Professor of Research at Wright State and was just named the 2020 Distinguished Historian by the Ohio Academy of History. His latest book, Firepower, How Weapons Started, how Weapons Shaped Warfare in the Age of the Gun will be published by Basic Books later this year. Paul, welcome. It's a big thrill for us to have you here. Well, I just wanted to me. show the books that I had purchased many, many moons ago and was uh, instrumental in my own research. So thank you for being here. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor. Terrific, terrific. Well, Paul, in your book, Whites of Their Eyes, you have, uh, you talk about Artemis Ward, and he's another neglected period, uh, you know, figure in this period of history but you discuss him at really length in your book. Can you tell us about his real role at Bunker Hill and also his role in pulling together the army? Well, sure. You know, and this wasn't my, I, I, I don't want to make, turn this into a plug for Artemis Ward, but one of the reasons I really wanted to write this book is I, um, I felt bad for the man um, because he has not been well treated by, even by academic historians who should know better. Um, you know, it's almost a punchline to a bad joke. And it, and it doesn't help that, Washington didn't like him. I think that's kind of the, you know, the final curse. Um, my wife joked about this. Well, when my, you know, my book came out near the same time as Jim Nelson's book and just sh shortly before Nat Philbrick's book, which all, you know, very close together. And my wife had pointed out that I, you know, that I cho chose the wrong hero. You know, perhaps I should have chosen, you know, the, the young widow doctor who was good looking with uh, you know, a bunch of kids. And uh, instead I chose the overweight Puritan with bladder problems. Um, and, because, and, and unfortunately, those are the things we remember about Ward. Um, but I, I, to me, the hero of this story, and for, or at least one of a group of heroes of this story in particular, the one that's been neglected the most, and, um, and, and for two main contributions that are both fairly broad ones, the, the bigger one being the fact that Ward supervises, not the only person obviously involved in this, but he supervises the creation and more importantly, uh, the maintenance of what becomes the first American army. Um, that um, just the act of, of taking that assemblage of men that emerges, you know, from the countryside after the, uh, after the Lexington alarm um, and manages to keep them there for the most part. I mean, granted, it's, it's, it's an army that's continually in flux, but keep them there, keep them housed, keep them fed, actually reasonably well fed, and create the... Um, the infrastructure of an army essentially from scratch. Um, so the fact that there is an army there to fight at Bunker Hill and the fact that there's an army there to actually greet Washington when he shows up um, is because Ward managed to do this. Is it an ideal army? Of course not. I mean, Washington cataloged all the problems that, that existed in it and, and, they're, and they're pretty damning. Um, but without Ward, I can't imagine there even being that group there to meet Washington. Um, and that you know is, is definitely a uh, definitely a, a skilled administrator and uh, and a great team to work with and and, um, and good relations with with Joseph Warren obviously in the Massachusetts Provincial Congress and, and that helped things a great deal but but he he certainly deserves a great deal of credit for that and when it comes to Bunker Hill of course he um, he tends to get a fair amount of a fair, fair amount of uh, disapproval for that uh, which again I think is unfair um, I remember Alan French. You know, and Alan French's history is the one that probably ticked me off the most enough to write about, <laughs> about Bunker Hill. Um, and that French had said, in order for his experiment to be a success, referring to, you know, the, the taking of the Charlestown Peninsula, um, Ward should have been bold. And, you know, first of all, you know, the taking of Charlestown Peninsula was not Ward's experiment. It was an act of desperation 
and Ward had said specifically Bunker Hill, not Breed's Hill. You know, uh, he ends up having to make up for um, the mistake or the intentional disobedience of either Israel Putnam or William Prescott, um, which which you know clearly forced Gage's hand and, and therefore the battle. Um, but I, to me, Ward's great virtue and the reason that he is an indispensable man in 1775 was his conservatism and the fact that he was not a risk taker, um, that he husbanded his resources, that he understood the most important thing was to keep the was to keep things going until this became an American war, until the Second, Second Continental Congress you know, came around to supporting uh, New England's war. Um, and so when it comes to Bunker Hill, um, he does what he can to help uh, you know, help feed the fight. The, the fact that a good number of his uh, intended reinforcements don't make it there has less to do with him and says more, really more about the quality of the colonels commanding Massachusetts provincial regiments than, you know, in, in 1775. Um, but uh, the fact that um, he was looking at a bigger picture than just what's going on in Charlestown. Now, part of that neglect of, of, of or, or uh, diminishment of Ward's role, I think, has to do with the fact that we often think of, and traditionally we thought of Bunker Hill as being a battle that is fought on the Charlestown Peninsula, neglecting the fact that there is something very real going on at Roxbury at the same time. Um, and that Ward not only was had in mind the intelligence that the British were planning on attacking Roxbury the next day, but the fact that Gage was intentionally pushing hard on John Thomas's forces at Roxbury specifically to, uh, you know, to, to, to set Ward off balance. So Ward had to be concerned about, about protecting Cambridge and, and about protecting Roxbury and not letting the day turn into the day that the revolution ended, which it could well have done uh, you know, had, um, you know, had, had things been conducted differently. So you know, to me, as I looked at this as a, uh, in my background, you know, primarily in European military history, I, I saw Ward as the man who kept Bunker Hill from turning into an absolute disaster. Uh, uh, granted, there I don't mean, to, again, to, to, to make him the only person who does this. Obviously, there's a good number of others. As Stark, clearly, for example, is one of those men that keeps Bunker Hill from being you know, a much shorter battle. Um, but, uh, but, but Ward, in particular, you know, the, 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 uh, um, the, the negative reaction to Ward over the years. I think is really a disservice. And, and the third element I wanted to introduce besides that is the fact that um, to me, Ward just, especially, and especially tragic in light of the, the reception that he's gotten over the years, Ward was a, you know, was a uh, um, he's, he's the ideal patriot. He's not self-serving self, -serv not self -serving or self-seeking. There's nothing flashy about him. Um, and yet, you know, two days after the Lexington alarm, he rides from Shrewsbury to, to Cambridge alone, while he's very sick and in a great deal of pain, not knowing what, what was there on the other side, and he did it anyway. Um, there's a man who just, who, who believed in the state and believed in the cause and believed in his nascent country and, and served them. Um, you know, Ward is one of those, one of those, not the only one, but anyway, one of those figures that, um, you know, that, that whole generation of 75, Ward included, of course, that have just you know, kind of slipped out of the pantheon, uh, unfortunately, or never made it into the pantheon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you did a great job of that in the in the book, Paul. But I wanted to piggyback on, on, I know that was one of the reasons for you writing the book, but I also wanted to, you to discuss your revisionist nature of the battlefield narrative. Oh, okay, yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that, that was the, um, there were a number of things that over the years, uh, uh, kind of sat ill with me about the traditional narrative. Now, Bunker Hill, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a most broad aspect, is not a complicated battle. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, but there were, there were things that just didn't make any sense to me as I, in, in particular, as I began to work more and more with 18th century European warfare. You know, one of them was, for example, the fact that uh, uh, a minor issue that that it's uh, you know frequently pointed as being as un, you know unusually have, unusually bloody battle, where really you know, in comparison to mid 18th century European battles, it's pretty much par for the course. You know, it, it's, it ranks up there with the major battles of Frederick the Great in terms of uh, proportion of dead and proportion of wounded. Um, that um, it uh, in, in getting down to, to uh, minor particulars, 
I wonder why it was that a, you know, what arguably Gage's best combat commander, Percy, is not, does not have anything to do apparently with the battle. Now I realize he didn't like how and how didn't like him, but um, it turns out that he does. It's just that again, he has more to do with Roxbury. Um, but you know, as I as I began to pick apart the pieces, there were some, there were just a, there were a myriad little minor issues that added up to a different battle when you put them all together. Um, so just to, without getting into without cataloging too much, I, you know, I wanted to point out a couple of things that I thought were uh, really needed to be redressed in a uh, addressed rather in a, a revision of the revisionist history of the, of the battle, which is um, first of all the you know the the misrepresentation of the opposing forces. Uh, Bunker Hill is, to me, is a, it's an important battle, not because it really, it clearly isn't decisive. It doesn't end the siege of Boston. It doesn't end the revolution. It, um, uh, it, of course, it, it, it ramps up the revolution, obviously, in a significant way. Um, but um, but it's, a, you know, it's a very American battle, right? The, Ameri the underdog versus, you know, this, uh, versus this great army. And of course, you know, where it comes to the to a popular narrative narrative of the revolution, anyway, we we tend to, I think, especially in popular history, we tend to gravitate towards kind of an American exceptionalist approach. You know, that um, for example, we we want the British to simultaneously have the best army in the world, which it is not. I mean, if somebody gives you a choice of an army to have in 1775, it's probably going to be France, Austria, or Prussia. Um, uh, granted, the British had a better way of projecting, had, were capable of projecting force in a way those other countries were not, thanks to the Navy. Um, but it's not the best army in the world. Um, at the same time, we want their commanders to be kind of ridiculous. And we want them to be the way that Cornwallis is and Mel Gibson's Patriot, right? They're just, they're so contemptuous of Americans that they deliberately do stupid things just to show how contemptuous of Americans they are. Uh, they're kind of foppish, and and they're not familiar with fighting in the wilderness. They're confounded apparently with battles that are fought on anything more uh, uh, more complicated than a you know I guess a manicured lawn or a tennis court. Um, and and you know, all these things flew in the face of what I knew of the British Army, which was the British Army was probably and, and if you've read Matthew Spring's book on you know with dealing with bayonets only, you know what I'm talking about here. Is uh, it was probably the most capable of European armies in fighting the regular wars and in fighting the Scots. I mean, look at the how they revised their tactics in dealing with the '45 uprising, um, and their fighting in North America had had revealed the British army to be kind of on the cutting edge of fighting a regular war. Um, so this isn't a hidebound, overly traditional army. It's an army that's adaptable, and and you know at the forefront of that movement in the 18th century are. William Howe and Thomas Gage, you know, who both like Americans, they respect Americans, they think a great deal of American martial virtues, and um, uh, they're the forefront of the uh, you know, light infantry movement in the British Army. So anyway, um, all those things together just seem to be that something must be wrong with the narrative, and, and the, uh, uh, the, the main things I think are, are, are these. First of all, the armies are both very, very green. Uh, extraordinarily green. You know, sometimes you'll, uh, and there's a lot of references, of course, to the, uh, to, to the rebel army having a fund of experience for the French and Indian Wars, but it's not particularly helpful experience. Uh, I mean, the, the, the French and Indian War is fought primarily by British regiments with provincial regiments playing a, a secondary role. And so the, who are the most combat capable men in the, uh, uh, or experienced men in the army? It's, it's, more or less Putnam and, and, and Stark, uh, and and their command experience didn't transcend the company level. I mean, these men had never led an army before. Ward was a, what an adjutant, you know, in a provincial regiment. He knew how to knew how to knew how to do bookkeeping. Um, the and the the average soldier in any one of the provincial regiments had never seen a hostile Native American, let alone fired at one before. Um, you know, you, and, and, and all the indications seem to be that. The majority of, of, of men in the American Army had almost no experience with firearms, um, which kind of goes against the very traditional American narrative about ourselves. We're, we're used to guns, right? Well, right. sure, if you're from the Berkshires, you know, but if you're from, you know, anywhere within 100 miles of Boston, you know, probably not. Um, the, um, uh, uh, the, the British Army, equally raw, better trained, better organized, drilled, etc., but uh, 
very, very few veterans, certainly amongst the enlisted, because you know, Britain really hadn't engaged in a battle since 1760. Um, outside of, you know, outside of some uh, engagements in, in North America right after the Seven Years' War. But um, so both very green armies, um, the British having an advantage that comes from having institutional memory, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, um, another, another point, of course, that, uh, uh, that, that, that struck me was the, um, the Howe versus Clinton debate. Um, that uh, you know, the, 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 the common narrative was always that, you know, once, um, uh, once the British discover the, um, uh, the redoubt on going up on, on Breed's Hill, that you know, Clinton and Howe and, and Gage get together at Province House and they, um, and they discuss their, uh, uh, their options. And Clinton is always portrayed as being the bold one. Let's hit them at daybreak. And we'll send a force, you know, up the mystic, and we'll cut them off at Charlestown Neck and we'll have them in a bag. Um, and then Howe, not being as enterprising as Clinton, certainly Howe was nowhere near as, nowhere near as good about uh, complaining about his past fortunes after his career was over as Clinton was. Um, that uh, that no, we should uh, we should just you know land troops at the uh, you know cross the cross the Charles and land troops and figure out what to do then. Um, and it's always been portrayed as Clinton as being this visionary, who's saying let's hit them now. Where Clinton says let's hit them at daybreak. Daybreak's already happened on on on, on the morning of the seventeenth. He's talking about hitting them the next day. You know when when the British were already planning on attacking Roxbury, and it made sense. Um, but the, you know, I thought I was just reading over French again this morning because I was looking for a specific quote. Um, and the, uh, the idea that, that Howe's ideas prevailed was they're more conservative, and, um, but that Howe was a victim of the 18th century leisure. You know, well, just, you know get him over whenever. You know, as a result, the, the, the council of war is over, you know, early mid-morning. And it's not till close to one o'clock that the army's ready to go. Mm -hmm. and, and having studied British amphibious operations, I began to think if getting an army into boats with their ammunition, with their field pieces, with their rations cooked in less than eight hours is slow, then what's fast? You can't just take the army and throw them across the Charles. They can't swim. You know, and uh, the fact that how managed to get together a, um, an amphibious operation in a matter of about five, six hours, to me, is just absolutely remarkable. Um, and uh, that, that, that he succeeded at this at all. But, but either way, it transforms the narrative from being uh, Clinton is, you know, Clinton is, is, is kind, of, kind of pushed to the side and how is, you know, how is the one who's, who's so relaxed about the whole thing, he's not in a hurry. How is the one who's saying, let's do it now. Let's do it as soon as we can, um, and uh, and I think probably overall the you know the the uh, the, the, the wisest uh, of, of, of the wiser of him and, and Clinton. Um, the um, again here we're just you know, I, I don't I said I don't plan on cataloging everything, but another issue comes up with the um, two of act, two attacks versus three. Did the British attack the Americans twice or three times? You know, in all the British sources, it's clear there are two assaults. And in American sources, it's fairly clear there are three. Now, it sounds like a trivial issue, you know, and I, I'll get to the, the, the import of that in just a minute, but um, you can see why the Americans thought there were three, but clearly Howe only ordered two. Um, neither were these frontal assaults, as we've been told. You know, Howe is not, is not just so contemptuous of Americans that he's attacking them from the front. He's planning turning movements, which were all the rage of the 18th century. This is, you flank the enemy. That's what Frederick, Frederick, Frederick the Great wins all the time, right, or what he does win. Um, so, you know, the first attack is an attack on the American left, and Stark makes sure that doesn't happen. Um, that devolves especially on the American left uh, between the light infantry who have been repulsed and then reform, and then the British grenadiers attacking the rail fence. That turns into this really poorly organized impromptu attack that Americans perceive as being a second assault. How didn't order it, it just kind of happened. Um, and then when that fails, how completely reassesses the situation and focuses on the redoubt and the breastwork right next to it. 
and sends his men in, a, in, in an assault column, which was a really kind of a tactical innovation of the 18th century, um, uh, a relatively loosely ordered attack, uh, attack column. Um, and that, of course, eventually works. But um, the two versus three thing matters when we're talking about Howe's generalship. Because if we're Howe's generalship is frontal assault, that doesn't work. Let's do it again. Frontal assault, that doesn't work. Let's do the same thing again. Frontal assault, okay, works this time. As opposed to flanking movement doesn't work on the left. Now let's try one on the right. And it works. It's the difference between an un unimaginative, likely incompetent battlefield commander and somebody who's actually pretty much on the top of his game. Um, and I, that's, you know, I think Hal was very much on the top of his game. Um, and and, and, and introducing yet another, another issue is that I think students of military history like soldiers' battles. They like to, they like to read about lions led, led by donkeys. I mean, this is a, the whole narrative of the First World War. We don't like to say the battle fails because the enlisted men failed. We like to blame officers. And yet what happens with the British Army is exactly the, 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 the officers are the ones who are taking tremendous casualties because they're trying their damnedest to get the men into line and moving the way that veteran troops would, should, but they're not dealing with veteran troops. They're dealing with green men. Um, and, uh, and so it's really the, you know, the, the house frustration with the battle is very similar to Gage's and Percy's after Lexington and Concord. Our men didn't do what they were supposed to do. They didn't have the discipline that we count on, you know, with, with, uh, with British soldiers. Um, so, so that, you know, th those were the, um, those are two of the big things. The other one I would already mentioned, of course, the fact that the battle isn't just Reed Hill and Bunker Hill. Uh, the battle is also Roxbury. Um, and while that doesn't really have a huge impact on the combat around Charlestown, it explains a lot about, uh, about Ward's generalship, about why he's so conservative. And it also re reveals Gage, I think, as being a fairly clever tactician. Um, somebody who understood that just you know, just blunt force applied to the, the leftmost part of the overall American position is, is not going to be enough, that Roxbury really is the sensitive it's the vault, you know, it's the underbelly of the, of the, of the American position. And, and the fact that he presses on that, I think is a, so all those things together, um, you know, but as I said, there, there's just a, there are just a million, a thousand little things that I, uh, that I found wrong with, with the established narrative that turned Bunker Hill into, I mean, they don't change the outcome of the battle, um, obviously, although I think they remind us that Bunker Hill was in fact a British victory and not an insubstantial one. Um, in, uh, in, in, a, in a tactical and strategic sense. Um, but that, you know, perhaps the, the, the leading figures in it, Gage, Howe, Clinton, uh, Ward, um, Stark, Prescott, Warren, uh, Putnam aren't quite necessarily the, you know, kind of the cartoonish uh, uh, figures with who are either, either heroes or villains or incompetence or geniuses. Uh, that they come out as and being in, in the popular narrative. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, Paul, you just answered my question about how engage in the, you know, the, the perspective of the, the leaders at that time. So uh, really, uh, Christian, why don't you go to our final question here about Warren's death uh, being a huge blow to the, to the Whigs? Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? And really, it, I, I think people don't realize what a huge blow it was. And But maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the the British side of this whole incident of Warren's death and what their reaction was. Well, you know, the thing is, oh, that, that, that fascinated me about looking at that from the British perspective is that is, is, is how well known Warren was. And, 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 and you know, I, I understood that, uh, that at least British leadership and, you know, especially locally, especially Gage, you know, et cetera, were, were well aware of, of, of Sam Adams, for example, who Sam Adams was, it was fairly obnoxious, uh, and, uh, uh, and and that they were aware of Warren. But the the, the fact that um, um, the fact that uh, uh, Howe, of course, gave him a great deal of credit in the, that remark he made about uh, the, what he was what he was worth in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of numbers of men, you know, to, to have him taken away from the, uh, uh, the from the from the cause. Um, but also the you know the uh, all that all that emerges around the um, uh, the desecration of Warren's body, um, which reflects uh, 
a broader familiarity amongst British forces with who Warren was, and the, the rep, he had a reputation that clearly went beyond the, the realm of, of, of provincial politics in the spring and summer of 1775, and he was recognized as being you know, this kind of key instrumental figure in, in, uh, in uh, promoting the rebellion, which absolutely surprised me. I, I didn't think that within, you know, within the British Army as a whole, there was that much of an awareness of of who Warren was, but you know clearly a um, the most recognizable rebel, if you will, in 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 Boston in 1775. Yeah, interesting. Look, before we go, can you give us a little sneak peek on the next book? Oh yeah, sure. Um, it's uh, as you mentioned, it's called Firepower: uh, How Weapon Shape Warfare in the Age of the Gun. Um, I've been teaching on this topic for you know, almost as long as I've been teaching college. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, I, I've had a long interest in the history of, of tactics, obviously, but particularly uh, the role of military technology and especially firearms technology. And firearms history is something I've dabbled with for, for years and, and uh, uh, owing to the fact that my, my paternal grandmother wrote, worked both for Springfield Armory and for Remington. And uh, besides making me memorize strange details about 18th century sailing rigs, she came from a whaling family, uh, she wanted. She uh, uh, would recite to me how you how you field strip the 1917 uh, Browning water cooled machine gun. She knew it reasonably well. Um, the um, but it, you know, one thing that struck me in dealing with military history is that um, while very often academic historians outside of military history think that military historians are interested in nothing but you know what they see as the more sophomoric aspects of military history, which is guns and you know guns and glory. That, that so often our, our understanding of military history is um, diminished, I think, by a misunderstanding of, of how firearms actually affect the way armies fight. Uh, we see this in a really big way, for example, with World War I and with the American Civil War. Uh, and so that, the whole idea with this, with this book was to see how, look at the interplay between, um, between technological development of firearms in particular. Um, uh, from the Renaissance to the end of the Second World War, um, and the impact both small and, and, and large, and, and, and the areas that don't have a big impact. You know, for example, the, the relatively minor impact that poison gas has on combat in the First World War. Not a decisive weapon, although it's a memorable, iconic weapon. Um, or the way that, uh, in, in particular, the Industrial Revolution um, has um, not just affected um, the mass production of, of, of weapons, but also the way in which research and development is done on, on, on weaponry and the, 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 the pace at which uh, technological change proceeds. And, and for that matter, the, the, the politics of military technology, how as the technology becomes more complex, um, the number of players in great power politics necessarily becomes more restricted. Um, as as lesser players are able to participate in the you know in, in, in that in that technological development, so that's that's essentially what I'm covering. It's it's the biggest topic that I've done by far, considering my you know my my last book was you know covered a battle a little bit more, uh, <laughs> and uh, before that was a biography, and previous to that had been you know have been uh, various histories of Denmark. Um, but uh, but it, it's 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 been a lot of fun to write it. Not as much fun as writing White to Their Eyes, which is probably the most fun I've had writing a book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still still uh, uh, having a great deal of fun with it. Um, I just just finished the the next the last draft, so this will will be coming out you know either at the end of this year or early next year. Excellent. Well, we'll we'd like to have you back. Uh, that's all the oh, time we have to today. That's all the time we had today for our discussion, but thanks, Paul. We really, really enjoyed it. Uh, you certainly led a unique insight into uh, in the Absolutely. battle of uh, the well, strategy about you know Breed's Hill and, and what went on. So we hope you well, come Thanks for giving me a chance to gab about it. <laughs> no, not at all. And really, if anyone hasn't read it, they really should pick up a copy of it. So. Absolutely. Well, we hope you come back. Well, I'm and, uh, happy to. And we'd, uh, to our viewers, we hope you've enjoyed this presentation with Paul Lockhart, historian and author. And uh, on behalf of my colleague, Christian Despigna, we'll say goodbye for now. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Randy.